So hi everybody, welcome to Localhost. My name is Rachel and I'm the Director of Operations at the Recur Center. Localhost is a series of monthly technical talks from members of the RC community, open to recursors and the general public. As always, we're excited to see so many new and familiar faces tonight. If you're not familiar with us, the Recur Center is a community-driven educational retreat for programmers. We're currently based in Soho, and people come from across the country and around the world to spend one, six, or 12 weeks becoming better programmers together in a self-directed and highly collaborative environment. At RC, you have the opportunity to direct yourself, to pick projects that you find intrinsically motivating, and to spend your time learning the things you always wished you could. People come to RC from a wide range of backgrounds and skill levels and use their time here to learn and work on almost any kind of programming project you can think of, from apps to games to compilers to art to original research. We're completely free to attend and we run an integrated recruiting agency to help anyone in our community interested in considering new jobs. If you enjoyed tonight's talk, please consider applying to RC. There's time to apply to our summer two and our fall batches. Okay, a quick note about how this talk will run. Mindy is gonna speak for about 30 minutes, after which we'll have a two minute break. During that break, you're welcome to leave or just to stretch a bit, and then after the break, we'll have dedicated Q&A time. Please do not ask any questions during the talk. There are a few reasons that we have a separate Q&A session. Taking questions during the talk is kind of disruptive, and having a break in between the talk and the Q&A keeps everything time boxed so that everyone can kind of schedule their night nicely. We also find that having a dedicated Q&A session leads to more equal audience participation and better discussions. Sound good? Great. Uh, that's enough about us. I'd like to introduce our speaker, Mindy Preston. Mindy attended RC when it was hacker school in 2014. Uh, ooh, she's a core team member of the Mirage OS project and a member of Rober.io, a nonprofit collective developing robust digital infrastructure. Tonight, she's gonna to talk to us about library operating systems and how they make systems programming accessible to everyone. Take it away, Mindy. Thank you. Hi. Um, so I'm gonna to talk to you about why I think that library operating systems help us democratize systems programming. So before I start talking about library operating systems, I wanna give you a sort of application-centric view on traditional operating systems. So as an application developer, I have something that I wanna write and something that I wanna run. They're probably related in some way. I have my code that I've written in whatever language I really like. I have some, probably some set of dependencies in that same program, programming language, some build system that knows how to weld them together and produce something that I can then use to do some sort of computation. And I have, a, these, I have a set of dependencies that I've expressed in the programming language that I'm using for my application, but I also have a really big dependency that's less obvious, which is once I have something, uh, some application that I've built, I need somewhere to run it. And implicit often in many of the functions that I'm calling in my application and the functions that are being called in the dependencies of my application is the support of an operating system to fulfill a whole set of calls that are normally not considered to be part of application level code. So things like I need to write a file or I need to connect to another host on the internet. Um, these, kinds of, uh, these kinds of functionality are provided by something that's bigger and sits underneath your code. And it gets to make, it gets to make um, decisions about whether it's going to fulfill your requests or not based on what it feels like doing for whatever reasons it might have. And also, you have to talk to it in its own terms. Um, so whether you personally in your application are writing calls to things like Socket, um, or whether there's some dependency in your language that's making this a little bit nicer and fixing the kind of impedance mismatch between what the operating system expects to see and what you want to write, someone somewhere has to talk to the operating system in a way that it can understand. So somewhere in your, somewhere in your stack, when you've built your application, there's something that knows how to deal with the operating system's abstractions like file handles in order to get the access to resources that the operating system is intended to give you. And the operating system cares about access to resources um, in a way that might not map to what we always want. So the usual situation that we think of when we think of these big traditional monolithic operating systems is we have a whole bunch of different applications that we want to run on top of them. And in the case of my laptop, that's great. 
because I can both run a terminal to show you my slides and like a clock to tell me how much time I have yet to talk, and that's great. But there are other situations where this is less good. And some of, some of these, situation, uh, some of these uh, circumstances in which we run our software are really, really common. And the fact that that's uh, not necessarily always required is important. So for example, if we take our application and we say, actually, I want to put this somewhere on the internet for other people to use, um, it's frequently the case that we actually don't want that application running with any other applications. Because if we have more than one application that the operating system is trying to service, we run the risk that our application, the one we actually care about, um, is going to be sh uh, given short shrift by the operating system for some other application, or that some other application might do something malicious that keeps our application from running. And so when we, when we deploy these things, often what we do is we actually deploy the application with its own copy of an operating system on top of something that knows how to run multiple operating systems as if they were all separate computers. So to our application and to the operating system that's running underneath it, it looks like a complete machine, but it's not. It's a virtual machine. And the thing that's running underneath it and, and um, managing the access to these resources is actually something called a hypervisor, like a supervisor, but more. <laughs> so in that situation, what's the operating system really doing for us? We have our user level application. We have our, uh, our sort of a language, the dependencies that are in our language that we all kind of mash together with our build system. Um, we have maybe some shared libraries that are ambient in the operating system. And then we have the way, that we talk to, the way that we talk to this operating system, which is still there. But all the operating system is doing is providing us with these nice abstractions. Um, so for example, if we, if we want to open a file and write to something, we still do it in the same way. But in order to actually provide the access to resources that are available on the machine, it's actually just going and asking the hypervisor. So. I mean, do we really need that? It seems useful, right? Like, we still, we still need to figure out how to say, I, I need to go write a file, I need to go connect to a computer. But if the operating system is just going to go off and ask the hypervisor, like, can we do better than that? If all we really need is some way to ask a hypervisor to go off and do something for us, and we don't need to actually do the hardware, the kind of hardware support that we would need to have, um, to have our application talk directly to hardware, like, can we replace those abstractions with something that wasn't written in, like, nine, in the, like the 70s or something that's nicer for our application code? Can we not translate um, a whole bunch of C code into whatever beautiful thing we um, might enjoy working in? And you may have guessed that the answer to this question is yes, as the answer to all such questions and all such talks is. <laughs> yes, and I'll tell you how. So in a library operating system, what we do instead is um, we, have a similar, uh, we have a similar execution environment where at the bottom we have a hypervisor that's, mid that's uh, managing the access to resources. And instead of having a traditional operating system, um, we have a, an interface layer that knows how to talk to a language runtime. And then uh, for our useful abstractions, we just write libraries in the language that we ordinarily use. Incidentally, uh, this set of stuff that runs on top of the hypervisor um, as sort of the output of a library operating system uh, kind of framework is called a unikernel. You may have heard this cool new buzzword. Now you are buzzword compliant, and you can tell everyone that you know you are like totally into unikernels. They're the hippest, newest thing as of 2015. Sorry. <laughs> so when you've built a whole bunch of unikernels, um, the, situ the uh, deployed situation um, when you have a hypervisor looks more like this, where you might have a whole bunch of more traditional setups where you have an application that's running on top of an OS, and the OS is talking to the hypervisor. But you can also have as many uh, unikernels running alongside that as your resources will support. And the, um, once, you've built, once you've built these things together, you can't really break them apart. It's like trying to, uh, it's like trying to, break, apart, um, trying to break apart a binary. Um, it's, just, it's just one unit of fixed thing. So um, as an aside, I want to talk a little bit about what these libraries actually look like in the library operating system that I use and love. Um, already name-checked, called Mirage OS, uh, written in OCaml, super cool. Um, so in Mirage OS, we, have, um, we use a feature, uh, some features of the language to uh, define how we are going to not just uh, write the libraries themselves, but define a common language for the libraries so that um, applications can say, 
um, can speak in terms of uh, common, um, common sets of functionality. So we make an interface definition for things like, um, for things like time-related operations or entropy-related operations, network-related stuff. Um, and in Mirage OS, we use the module type system for that. In other kinds of languages, you might use something like a type class or you might use inheritance in an object-oriented language. Um, the idea is that you can use whatever makes sense for you. You don't have to, uh, you don't have to inherit old ideas about how you would do this. Uh, you can uh, use whatever like maybe your build system might like for you to do for interchangeable parts with modules. Um, and in Mirage OS, for implementations of specific interfaces, we just use the module system. So we can say all modules um, that provide a network have to have a send function, and the send function has to exist in terms of these particular types. And then users can just write their code in terms of that particular module type. So you can replace stuff like this code, uh, which if you've ever written uh, network code in C, uh, will look familiar to you. And unfortunately, if you've ever written network code in something that isn't C, it might also look familiar to you. <sighs> because every, uh, almost every language wants you to write your code in like some covered over version of this exact thing, where you have a function uh, called socket, and you pass it some magic numbers, and you're supposed to go either use some aliases for the magic numbers that are also pretty magic, or go look in a big table and find the magic numbers. And you get back another number, and if the number is negative one, you have sad times, and you have to go look at another number to figure out what that meant. Um, but if you got a non-negative one number, you can use that number to call another magic function that you have to populate with some other numbers. Um, and then once again, remember to check your errors and all that stuff. So in, uh, in the programming language that I use, we have our own version of, uh, we have our own slightly nicer version of this. But if we're writing a library operating system, we don't have to get to this point just to get our connection. We can say, you know what? I know how I want to say that I want to create a connection. I'm going to call this function create connection. It's going to take a network device. It's going to take an IP address and a port. And it's going to give me a stream that I can talk on, or it's going to tell me why it couldn't. Um, this, uh, result data, this result IO is um, evocative of another really nice feature of uh, unikernels and library operating systems, which is the, um, it's frequently the case when you're writing, uh, when you're writing code um, in a specific language that you might want some notion of concurrent code. So you might want pieces of your code to be able to stop doing stuff or start doing stuff depending on like, what kind of yielding. depending on what kind of yielding and blocking you want to do. <laughs> and unlike that sentence, uh, you might not want to be preempted. <laughs> so um, in a library operating system, you don't have like, some operating system notion of threads that's going to come in and interrupt your program in the middle of, in the middle of whatever it's doing. Um, this this uh, little I.O. type here is, um, is a hint to we're only using um, one specific way of scheduling different stuff uh, within the unikernel. We have, um, we have a lightweight threading library, and that's it. You can't get preempted. That's all. So implementations are like fairly pedestrian-looking code. Uh, sorry if you don't read OCaml. Um, please trust me that this, is, this sea of symbols represents a, call, a function that's calling another function. It's dealing with some errors. It's going to log them and then return back the type to you or tell you, yes, everything went great, thanks. There's nothing, and there's nothing magic about this code. Uh, pretty much no matter how deep you dig into making a TCP connection in Mirage OS. If you are an OCaml programmer, you can understand it. And you can even probably improve it. So I'm going to give you a really quick demo just to kind of show you uh, more concretely what I mean uh, about these individual little pieces. So I have a unikernel. I have it right here. Um, it's a piece of code that wants to do some stuff with time. So it has a declared dependency on needing to know what time is. Um, and it is essentially a hello world. It's going to say, hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. That's what the smiley face is. Sleep a little bit and then keep doing it. So I'm first going to build it as um, a binary that can run in a traditional operating system. I'm going to build it. And I'm going to run it. Yay. So OK, I can write a hello world. But what I can also do, if I can type, 
very hard to type when people are watching you. Uh, what I can also do is build um, a unikernel representing this particular binary. So let me show you. Uh, I'll make it a little bit more clear by showing you just the, uh, just the piece that I've just made. So uh, this hello.vertio is the entire uh, application language runtime and the pieces that we need to interface to, um, in this case, a KVM-based hypervisor. So what I can do with this particular artifact, if I, had, um, if I had a computer that was running a different hypervisor, I could just run it here, but I can't. So what I've done is I've shifted up to Google Cloud and I've told it that it should go. I've done all of the, um, th there's a small amount of translation that you need to do to tell Google Cloud, like, yes, this is actually, uh, this is a complete image, this very small thing. Please just boot it. Trust me, it's going to be great. So, so I'm going to try and reboot it. I'm very sorry for doing a demo that involves the network. I couldn't think of another way to do it. So hopefully, uh, hopefully we're all good here. Phew. So there's our virtual machine that's booted, uh, that's booted in Google Cloud. Um, you can see the, uh, the hypervisor layer stuff is here. Um, Solo 5 is the uh, particular hypervisor layer that we're using. Uh, we've got our memory map. We uh, have some clock, like we asked for, um, some virtual networking stuff that we don't actually need. Um, the, hy the hypervisor tends to give it, will give us that whether or not we use it. Um, and here's our hello world. <laughs> so I think that's pretty full stack development, personally. Um, and I'd like to uh, go on and tell you about some more things that I think are exciting about building software this way, um, based on some ideas that maybe, maybe you'll agree with. Um, but having stuff that makes it harder to dig into software, like stuff, software that you're running and you care about, anything that makes it hard is bad, and anything that makes it easy is good. So um, a consequence of being able to substitute out these implementations um, for default ones, um, and being able to say, like, OK, these implementations are just libraries, and they have to fulfill this module type, but other than that, I don't have any restrictions on them. I can swap them out as I like is that we can write our own for whatever reason we might have. Like, maybe we don't like the congestion control algorithm in the TCP that we get by default, so let's make another one. Or maybe we like testing in really pathological conditions. Maybe we want to test how our application does, like, if the network is always super busy, or like, if, um, if we can never write to the file system, if the DNS in our system is always super busted, and um, we can simulate like a condition where we're always under a man in the middle attack and make sure that our, our authentication mechanisms are working correctly. Um, we can do a couple other really useful things that you often have to do with complicated mocks in other kinds of systems. Like say, um, I want you to use this random number generator that always returns this list. And we can also develop our, do our systems programming like an application developer does, does programming. Um, some of the original motivation for this work was a desire to write driver code and write operating system code in a way that it's, it itself was easy to test. So rather than testing application code um, with different implementations, it was a desire to test different impl implementations without having to have a super complicated monolithic kernel test harness. And we do this a lot in Mirage OS um, because we have people um, who are really, really obsessive about testing involved in that project. And it's really nice to be able to use the totally normal um, OCaml test infrastructure to do all of our operating system testing. Um, this is, again, code that is very, very boring if you read OCaml. Um, check some stuff in memory. Make sure it doesn't crash. But having a network stack that doesn't crash is a super useful property. So. I'm, uh, I'm a little bit surprised, honestly, that uh, people are smart enough to do engineering without testing tools like these. Like, I find it really reassuring when I can just like, run some tests and it tells me my TCP implementation is OK. I don't even need to be root. I can just run them. I can run them whenever I want. But there are 
wilder things that you can do than just you know write some unit tests and run them and say like yeah I did a great job. Um, so a lot of times when we're doing systems development, we have to worry a lot about state, and we have to worry a lot about how we can interrogate state within a system. And the way that we traditionally do this when we're trying to figure out like my program's gone wrong, I don't know what's happening, is we open up a shell and we like make a bunch of guesses. Like we basically, we, we play Sherlock Holmes with our systems when we're trying to figure out like some strange state is happening and I, I'm, I, I don't know why and I don't know what. But maybe if we have ways of managing, uh, of managing all of the things that are involved in our system, we can think more carefully about how we deal with state everywhere. So for example, if we build all of, if we build, li if we choose to use libraries and build libraries, that have some capability for recording things that they do with state, then we can have some access to things like why the system uh, chose, chose to do a particular thing, not just that a system is in a state, but how long a system has been in a state for, what changed it last, and maybe even why. We did some um, experiments with this in Mirage OS with a library called Ermin, which is, uh, you can imagine as making everything be in Git, kind of. Um, to some degree of accuracy. And it lets you do really cool things like, um, say for example, uh, in your network stack, you have, uh, you've had some, uh, mass some changes to uh, the address of the computer that you want to talk to to get to the internet. Not only can you see, okay, I thought that I was supposed to talk to the authorized computer over here, but now it says I'm supposed to talk to this other random ass computer over here. What the hell? You don't just get to see this has changed but you can see, okay, what component in the system was the last thing to change this? So instead of having to look through, look through like a whole bunch of log messages and try to play detective, you have, um, you have like an actual information trail that hopefully can lead you directly to what you might need to change in potentially a complex system. Another useful thing is um, you can, I mean, you can do this, you can imagine this in all sorts of components that we don't normally have good access to figuring out um, forensic information about. Like if you have a scheduler that tells you uh, why exactly it is that it's running this thread for this amount of time, or why exactly it is that this thread died. Um, and if you, can, if you can express this information in ways that are useful to you with uh, even normal developer tools, you can do cool things like show graphs of the entire uh, set of execution trace trees in the system for the entire time it was alive. We have a thing to do that, it's very cool, I don't have it installed, sorry. <laughs> but um, I think that this is also interesting. Um, outside of the context of servers, I kind of motivated uh, why we would think about doing this with an example about running something in the cloud. Um, but you know, hypervisors aren't just useful in the cloud. The reasons that we want to do uh, that we want to keep our applications in separate environments also totally apply to our personal computers. They might even apply harder to our personal computers that we carry around with us and that have microphones and cameras and are with us while we sleep in the same room. So it's not completely outlandish that you might want a hypervisor on your personal computer. Um, and if you do, and you've decided that you want to separate these concerns of all these things that are running on your system by running them as independent virtual machines, you might also discover that you want those virtual machines to be small because the set of resources that you have is limited. Like you're not just gonna say, okay, Amazon buy me, uh, I wanna pay for like four more cores right now um, on your laptop. So you, the, motiv the motivation for using unikernels in that context is, uh, is um, more based on both performance and resource use. Like a, a, a minimal Linux installation is still pretty big, but a minimal unikernel is really, really tiny. So we have a whole bunch of um, projects in Mirage OS uh, that are aimed at replacing these uh, little, bits of, little bits of functionality that in um, an operating system like Cubes are usually an entire Linux VM with just one application running on top of it with just the application and what it needs. So um, I wanted to uh, thank AppNexus for hosting me. I wanted to thank Recurse Center for local hosting me. And I wanted to thank all of you for your attention, your questions, and your ideas. And I think maybe I talked too fast, or not fast enough. OK. All right. <laughs> Thanks.
Okay, uh, so we only have two rules for our Q&As. The first rule is before you ask a question, check in with yourself and make sure you are indeed asking a question and not making a statement to Mindy. If you would like to make statements to Mindy, you may do so at a later time, but not during the Q&A. Um, make sure it's a question, please, please, please. Oh, sorry. Oh. <laughs> Great. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> um, the second rule is if you are unsure about whether you do ask your question, you feel like maybe it's not a great question, please ask it anyway. It's likely that it is a fine question, and it's also likely that somebody else is wondering about the same thing. So don't worry and don't edit yourself too much. Cool? Ready? Great. Ready. Nick and I are going to be walking around. I'll be on this half of the room. Nick is going to be on that half of the room. Just make eye contact with one of us, and we'll bring you the microphone at some point. Okay. Hi. Um, so Mirage OS is in OCaml. Are there any like similar fright like unikernels written in other languages? Loads of them. Um, so the ones that the ones that always come to my mind immediately because I'm most familiar with them are Helvium, which is a Haskell project. Uh, there's also Includos, which is a C++ project. C++ project that uh, I'm assured uses only the good parts of C++. Um, there's also a Clive, I think, which is a Go project. Uh, there are a few JavaScript projects. Um, and there are a few projects that are uh, actually not language specific. Uh, there's one called OSV, which um, is pointed at uh, trying to replace basically POSIX syscalls with uh, something library based. There, uh, you might also be interested in the Rump kernel project, uh, which, is, um, which is based in uh, taking some of the drivers in NetBSD and making them libraries. Um, initially for testing purposes, but it's also useful in building one of these minimal things. Uh, if you go to unikernel.org, um, there's a list of them there. Hey. Um, what's, what's the best way to get unikernels uh, shared by one uh, hypervisor to communicate with each other? Uh, so that depends on the hypervisor. Um, if you have a hypervisor that provides like a really nice uh, shared memory channel interface, like Zen's vChans, then you can talk over Zen vChans. The problem then is you have to be sure that you're on the same hypervisor. Um, uh, other than that, it's basically the general question of how do I get two computers to talk to each other. Uh, clarification question. So when, so per the question of, you know, oh, are there things like Mirage OS in other languages? Like you said that, you know, one of the reasons you use Unicron is so you can write nice OS-y stuff in your language of choice. Do you use a unikernel library that matches that language of choice? Or like, how, like, do you use Mirage OS and you don't have to use OCaml? Or how does that work? Um, I'm not really sure why you would use one of the language-specific projects if you had another language in mind. Um, you probably could do it via um, FFIs or uh, some kind of, some kind of like foreign, uh, foreign language call system. But I'm not really sure why you would attempt it. Uh, did that answer your question? I'm not sure that I did. Also, I don't know where um, maybe you are. it's kind of it's kind of the oh yeah hey, hey. <laughs> uh, um, is a question of um, like does like does Mirage OS in terms of like the unikernel ecosystem like does it enable unikernels written in OCaml or does it enable unikernels and so it sounds like it enables unikernels in OCaml and then there are other things that enable unikernels in other languages is that correct yes that's correct okay thank you. Um, so I know in like more traditional operating systems, like your application is operating in like um, user mode on the CPU and then you issue a syscall and it switches to kernel mode. In a unikernel, like does that still happen or are you like always in like? So uh, the virtual machine um, has, uh, in, in a unikernel, the virtual machine itself has like one unified address space and it's running pretty much always in the same mode. From what I understand, this is getting into uh, layers, of, layers of how they work that I'm not 100% familiar with, so I might say something wrong in trying to answer your question. But from, um, from the kind of like traditional operating system and application split, there isn't one. Um, you don't have like data that's protected from the application because it's part of the libraries that comprise like what we would traditionally think of as an operating system. You just have the hypervisor's protection. Is that scary? <laughs> I find, honestly, I find traditional operating systems much scarier than that. <laughs> All right. Uh, so there's, to my understanding, there's more than one kind of like hypervisor. Um, yeah. And 
So is Mirage written for a single hypervisor? Is it written for multiple hypervisors? Like how much work is it to extend Mirage to brand new hypervisor X? It depends on brand new hypervisor X. Um, so for a long time, uh, Mirage was Zen only. Um, and a couple years ago, some people at IBM did some work to uh, make kind of a um, sort of an abstraction layer for hypervisors, uh, and combination abstraction layer for hypervisors and the thing that lets Mirage OS run on KVM. Um, and we've been able to, uh, some people have also been able to use that abstraction layer, which is called Solo 5, the thing that had the nice cool banner in the um, Verdio layout, uh, to port to another hyperver hypervisor called Mwen. Um, I actually do have links for both of those here. Um, so it is less work than it used to be, but still some work. Um, my question would be, so first of all, uh, OCaml is garbage collected, right? Yes. So that is then something that's historically unpopular with operating systems. Is that of any, like, if it, it, is that still a problem when you're only running one application, is, or, or does that change that concept? If you have super strict real-time requirements for the application, it can be a problem. Um, but you wouldn't have been using a garbage collected language for your application in the first place if that were the case. Um, that is something that makes it really useful to have uh, the, um, the uh, like a recording scheduler that I mentioned earlier, is it can also record when there are GC pauses. So if you're having trouble figuring out what the timing of your application is and why, and like if you're worried that you're spending a lot of time in GC for whatever reason, you can use that and also the languages tools for figuring out what's happening with memory pressure um, to alleviate some of those problems. There, I mean, there are certainly systems developers who say garbage collected language, um, and for them, there are unikernels like include us. Um, so you've described several things that like could make a unikernel a unikernel, like not having memory protection or being linked directly to the program you're writing. Mm -hmm. uh, do you think there's like a specific thing that is a distinction between a unikernel and like a regular kernel, or is it more of a blurry line? I think it's pretty blurry. Um, if you had, uh, to me, to me, like, uh, to me, having like nice mo module boundaries is a really important part of it. But that's really more of a library OS thing than a unikernel thing. Like, you could, um, there's a, there's a fairly, there was a fairly popular uh, a blog post that came out that was fairly popular uh, around the time it was released, uh, which was pointing out that like there aren't that many dissimilarities when you look at uh, unikernel as built by Mirage OS and like DOS. Um, that there are things there are things missing in DOS that are also missing in a unikernel built by Mirage OS, and yeah, that's true. Um, whether or not those things are important to you is it depends. Um, in terms of what makes a unikernel, uh, you can ask like ten different unikernel engineers and get ten different opinions. Uh, but it does have a Wikipedia page, so I defer to Wikipedia. <laughs> How do drivers work with hypervisors? Is there are there hypervisor level drivers or what? Yeah. So um, in the case uh, in the case of the things that we want to target uh, for library OSs, like when we're when we're writing the actual hypervisor, um, the code that knows how to talk to the hypervisor, uh, the reason uh, th there's a common interface for those that uh, operating systems will use um, if they know that if they know that they're being virtualized. So um, uh, this is called virtio for virtual IO for a lot of stuff. Um, and so you can get away with writing a driver that just targets Vert.io, and then the hypervisor does, all, does basically the operating system work of taking that Vert.io stuff and knowing I have this particular type of network card send stuff this way. Um, getting back to garbage collection for a second, uh, if you have like a very large, so sorry, I, 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 I'm just having a hard time thinking of how the unikernel interacts with things like it owns the TCP stack, or the network stack. And if there's a gigantic garbage collection in the middle uh, of receiving some packets, like do the packets get dropped? Does the hypervisor um, store some packets for you, or? Sometimes. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, you do, you do want to pay attention to, uh, you want to pay attention to queuing, and you want to pay attention to uh, what, where the hypervisor is dropping stuff. And if you, uh, in my experience, it is extremely unusual to have a garbage collection long enough that you will uh, outrun the amount of buffer space that you have in any like default um, default configuration of anything that I've ever worked with. Like it, for me, it's just been a complete non-issue. Um, yeah, I can Im you can imagine pathological cases where garbage collection might take that long, um, and in that case, yeah, you would have to make recourse to 
uh, the tools that you have for dealing with, I had a garbage collection happen in the middle of my program, or my program is slow and I don't know why. So um, my understanding is that the uh, unikernel is kind of roughly equivalent to single process, and mm. like, like a, uh, would that be a fair assessment to say that a, a unikernel is not really a good fit for an application that needs to use sub-processes like or forks or create process for uh, their yeah. own security? Yeah, um, if you have your application architected in that, it's kind of like the same problem of like if you're trying to move to a more microservice architecture kind of thing, is if your application is architected such that you have like one boss process and a whole bunch of sub-processes sub that all want to run on the same host in the same operating system, like you're, you're going to have a bad time. Uh, just to clarify, if I wanted to install Unikernel on my laptop, for example, mm -hmm. does it mean like I have to erase my operating system or like what is like, does it replace an operating system, essentially? Um, so what you would want to do is install a hypervisor, um, which, you, which with uh, certain Linux distributions, you can actually just like apt-get install hypervisor. And it will take your existing operating system, lift it up into a virtual machine, and install the hypervisor underneath it. And then you can run a unikernel alongside. That's, what, that's, um, that's how uh, my other computer works. This one is a cubes machine, so it came that way. Uh, can you compare a library operating system to a container and when you would use one or the other? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in, in, with containers, you have, uh, you have a Linux kernel, um, which is often also running on top of a hypervisor, but that's uh, not really important for talking about containers. And then you have some segmented view of the, the uh, services that the kernel provides that are intended to keep the applications running within the containers from interfering with one another. Um, and also to uh, you have some probably some sort of system that knows how to route things that are in containers in specific ways related to the operating systems, um, resource gathering and parceling and stuff. Uh, in this case, you still, you still have a Linux kernel. It's just, uh, it's just sort of divided up and shared. You have more of a divided user space than a divided full memory space, if that makes any sense. So you are running cubes on this machine, and you did the demo with Google Compute Engine. Is, are there some gotchas around running Mirage instances directly on cubes? Uh, like if I go home, can I do this right now? You can, but it's just a little bit too fiddly for a demo. Um, because cubes doesn't, uh, cubes doesn't actually want you to make entire virtual machines and then just say, Dom0, go run this. Like, uh, and then say to the hypervisor, yo, go run this thing I made. Like it's kind of against Cubes' whole like, permissions model because it's trying to make it such that uh, your virtual machines can't actually just do arbitrary stuff. Um, so you have, to, you have to do like a lot of manual setup. Um, and what I usually do is make a, make a Cubes object that's like a testing unikernel and then just like shove unikernels in and out of there. But it takes a little bit um, and a little bit of scripting and it's just kind of not the point. So. Um, hi, I have a quick question that's kind of uh, on the driver side of things uh, from earlier. Uh, could you access, say, the GPU or some other like custom hardware from uh, a unikernel, and like would that, in this case, entail having um, an entire driver in OCaml? Um, what's the? That's a really good question. I have no idea. <laughs> um, I don't, I don't know how well hypervisors deal with things. I mean, they must deal reasonably well with access to GPU because you can buy it on AWS. Um, so that must be, to some degree, a solved problem. But I have no idea how it works or how hard it would be to target. Um, I don't even know what GPU, what good support for GPU stuff we have in OCaml to begin with. Uh, probably you'd have better luck with, um, probably you'd have better luck with somebody else's unikernel for that. I am not in machine learning, if you couldn't tell. So I guess going back to one of the questions of, well, if you have a, you can't really like, fork. Mm -hmm. So I guess, how do you debug in kind of arbitrary contexts? Because that seems sort of tricky. Because obviously you can have things where you can like to, uh, basically effectively patch the scheduler to output information and trace mm -hmm. things to slash proc. But if you have something like, something's going wrong now and I don't know why, mm -hmm. like how do I figure that out? And I'm also sorry if that straddles the boundary between making a statement and a question. <laughs> No, it's a, it's a reasonable question. Like, I, I think that in general, we don't really do very well at 
knowing how to debug sort of the class of things that isn't stuff that you interact with. Like this is a problem with microservices and containers too, um, where you have like you have this thing that you've specifically made such that you don't interact with it, and you've gone into this whole like cattle not pets kind of idea of I should never I should never touch a machine with my hands. But if you you have to react to problems as they happen, and it's very infrequently that you have the problem that you thought you had. Um, and I think that. Uh, as in general, in DevOps, we don't really have good answers for that. Um, that said, so um, <laughs> the, uh, we do have GDB server integration for some Mirage OS targets. So, um, the, so uh, it is one side of the Solo 5 targets, which I, I don't remember which one it is, uh, where you can actually say, like, I want to attach a debugger, and then you can inspect state in this way. Um, if you want to do that. Uh, there's also um, some work that's being done in the Kubernetes space that I think is really cool um, that's kind of built on top of GDB to make like nicer debugging for microservices in these big distributed architectures, uh, which is done by, um, it's called Squash. It's done by a team called Solo.io. So I, yeah, I guess, my, I guess my answer to your question is um, it's a reasonable question because we are kind of bad at it. And yeah, <laughs> I've given you the best answers I have. <laughs> So uh, does this really change how uh, people, uh, what to build on top of rather than what to build with, uh, if you can understand what that means? Hmm. I'm not sure I understand. OK. Um, so, uh, so you're talking about that the unikernel is replacing this, you know, monolithic big system. Yeah. Um, and, and you know, you're talking also about the fact that it's more about the application rather than you know the system that you're building on top of. So that's uh, if you can understand what I mean. So um, I, I find that to be a useful way to talk about library operating systems and unikernels with people who aren't necessarily security people. Um, my background is in computer security. And that's the reason that I personally found this approach to be, um, to be really compelling, is that I wanted, um, I wanted less complex systems because I, thought that because I thought and still think that less complex systems are harder to subvert and harder to exploit. And that's not really a very positive view of things. Um, and as I was working more with unikernels, I discovered as sort of side effects of using this thing and uh, becoming like more of an application developer that they were really nice in all of these ways that uh, these other kinds of these other development paradigms and other systems weren't. And I think that we're still finding like nice emergent properties of that system. Um, and once I know what more of them are, there will be more slides about them in talks that I give. I think that has been a fundamentally not very satisfying answer for which I apologize. <laughs> uh, are there any bonus slides that we haven't seen yet? Mm. <laughs> yes. There's a bonus meta slide about the slides. <laughs> um, because I, I'm, I'm not really very good with like visual things. I find like fussing with slides to be really distracting. So I write a text document and then I show it to you this way. And I hope it's not too distracting, um, because I, I think, it, it, I don't know, some people find it intimidating and think that it looks like kind of too leet. Um, but if somebody has a suggestion for like a way to write slides where you're just making the text and then you can show it and like it's reasonably legible and everything is fine, um, I'm always happy to hear those. Um, hi, another question over here. <laughs> uh, so. Um, so you said your background is in security, um, and one thing that like is kind of interesting or uh, worrying is: um, Does this mean that we have to all write like TLS in our own language? I'm I can't do that. Okay. Um, <laughs> I can't even pretend I could try. Yes. Um, is that like a problem? This is actually kind of a major selling point of Mirage OS versus the other uh, versus the other unikernels. Is we do have a TLS. Um, it seems pretty good. Uh, um, I, somebody put, uh, so there, there was a project um, after this TLS stack was released uh, called the Bitcoin Pinata, which is um, essentially a, a unikernel that um, you can, uh, will, provides a nice automatic way for you to do a man in the middle, um, man in the middle atta uh, attack on it. Like it will do a TLS connection only to something that has verified uh, certificates on both sides and then tell you the private key to a Bitcoin wallet that has 10 Bitcoin in it. And I wanted 10 bitcoins, so I tried, and I didn't get it. So uh, other people also tried, and they didn't get it either. Uh, you can't prove that something is secure in this way. 
Um, but uh, there were numerous open SSL bugs during the time that the Bitcoin pinata was online. Um, to, uh, to the point about having to write uh, TLS like in your, own, in your own language, I agree that it's pretty irresponsible to go off and say like, well, I need a TLS, so I'll just write one. Um, and I don't have a, a super good solution to the general problem of uh, I want to write a program that needs TLS and there's no TLS in my language. That's not just like, I'm sorry, bro, good luck with C stubs. So I feel like I understand um, sort of the benefits of this library operating system, but I'm not sure I understand when I would use one, like in what situation I would find myself using one. Mm -hmm. um, and sort of to that point, I wanted to ask, if I find myself in a situation where I think I should write a kernel module, is that a situation in which I should use a library operating system instead? Ooh, uh, that's a really good question. I think if you're in a situation where you would write a kernel module, it, I think it really depends on the kernel module. Like if your kernel module is a driver, um, I would say probably not. Um, if your kernel module is something like um, a, like a different congestion control algorithm for TCP or something, then probably yes, um, that might be that might be a good reason to do that. For me, um, anytime I want to put a server online, I want it to be a unikernel, and anytime I have something that I can succinctly describe the function of that I want on my laptop, I want it to be a unikernel. Question here: What are some challenges that make it hard to have a unikernel that supports multiple languages? Yeah, um, so it's uh, so the e often the easiest way to have projects in general that are written in a whole bunch of different languages is to just uh, imagine the modules as separate components that then can talk to each other over some uh, over some shared channel that is exactly as if they were running on separate computers. Like it, it's just sort of it's it's often difficult to have projects that work well that are multilingual. Um, and I think that that's really the problem with that, um, and that we haven't, uh, in Mirage OS, we haven't solved that well for any languages other than interfacing with C, because that's really all that anyone who, uh, that's, that's all people have mostly been interested in, um, although there's some interest in doing it with Rust. So, in terms of what makes it actually difficult, uh, I'm not qualified to answer your question, sorry. Have you heard of any projects that are using a unikernel to like exploit or discover vulnerabilities in the, in the hypervisor? Say, like, I'm a bad citizen of using the Ethernet card, mm -hmm. and that would hinder the other VMs that are running on the hypervisor. Mm -hmm. Uh, so there was a project, uh, it was actually like a, a, I can't remember whether it was an outreach or a Google Summer of Code project to do that um, in Zen uh, over the summer. Uh, either this summer or last summer, I can't remember which one. Um, it's uh, mostly, mostly as a mechanism for basically doing fuzzing on the hypervisor um, because uh, you can't, it's hard to isolate those libraries. If you had a library hypervisor, you wouldn't have to. Um, but uh, pretty much just as a method for input injection. Um, hi. So you gave this demo of a like, writing error thing that printed something every second uh, and then ran it. How do you think about, as like the developer of a library operating system, how do you think about the split of what stuff belongs in that binary and what stuff belongs in the hypervisor? Oh, uh, what stuff belongs in the hypervisor is the stuff that the hypervisor already has. Like, I, I've never in my life touched hypervisor code. Um, so for me, for me it's, a, it's a complete non-issue. It's uh, much, much in the way that when you're writing an application, like it, it, is, it is fairly uncommon for you to say, like, I, I need new kernel functionality for this particular thing that I'm doing. It happens sometimes, but it's not that frequent. Hi, I was actually wondering a little bit about the history of unikernels, particularly with Mirage. Like, what, what was that, like, wow, the world sucks moment that inspired sort of this whole uh, sort of area to take off um, and mirage to form. So um, it's well, it's a really old idea. Uh, if you look up uh, the word exo kernel, um, you can find some of the roots of projects like projects like Mirage OS. Uh, but the thing that made the thing that made this possible really was hypervisors, because otherwise, if you wanted to make a library operating system um, that you could deploy anywhere, you were stuck. Like uh, especially if you wanted to write one in a new language, you were just stuck writing a zillion drivers. And you just couldn't do it. Like you're never going to keep up with, 
even a small set of what comes out in terms of desktop or server hardware. So in terms of making these things feasible, um, I think the real thing that kicked that off was uh, the availability of hypervisors and these virtualized interfaces where you can write one driver and then be done. Um, I am, uh, I'm, uh, unfortunately, the right person to answer this question was in town yesterday and is in, no longer in town today. Um, but uh, I, th I think you can trace a pretty di direct line from the exokernel projects um, to, uh, to Zen, to Mirage OS. Um, the way that uh, the Zen support for Mirage OS worked is it's based on a Zen project called MiniOS, which is we need to make sure that the hypervisor can boot stuff what's the smallest uh, operating system that we have that we can make to be able to boot things. Um, and then once you have that, it's like, well, can I put a language runtime on top of it? Well, can I run some other stuff? Can I run everything? Hey, uh, so you mentioned that the, there's an interface that is used to basically like um, define all the things that the, uh, uh, like a unikernel is supposed to be able to do, like an application is supposed to be able to do. So that, does that mean that you can just run a unikernel like just on top of, like it might be really slow, but should you be able to run it as a regular application? Sorry, can you repeat that last bit? Yeah, uh, does that mean you can just run, so you can, write a, you can write your unikernel, but can you just run it as a regular application since it, does, it doesn't need to like necessarily run on top of a hypervisor? Yeah, so um, if, you, if you write your application, there, we actually have a whole bunch of um, implementations that are translating uh, the um, uh, APIs that we have in Mirage OS back to things like sockets and syscalls um, so that you can uh, run your application locally if you want to. Um, we, have, we have some uh, a few extra tools for doing that in Mirage OS because it's frequently really useful to be able to use the operating system's networking stack rather than yours if you have like some complicated networking setup. Um, or uh, to be able to use like the operating system's disks instead of a virtual disk that you would have to write to on a block level. Um, in that case, in that case, it, it, the operating system is basically like just a, another target. Would it ever make sense to run a container inside a unikernel, maybe to have more languages supported? I believe the answer to that question is no. Because in order for containers to make sense, um, you, really need, you really need the idea of like, I have some services that are provided and I have some other things that are using those services within that context and I want to provide only some subset of those services to some set of things. I want to like keep them separate. And I think the way that you would do that in a library operating system is either, I think the way that you would do that in a library operating system is just have multiple unikernels. Like, I don't think, I, I can't think of a scenario where you would want to do something like that in any kind of architecture that people are talking about that I have seen. Also, there's a library called Containers in OCaml, um, which I've really wanted to write a trolley blog post, like, using unikernels with containers, and then people click it, and they're like, this is a standard library replacement. <laughs> I thought this was Wales. This isn't Wales. <laughs> um. Are there any examples of like unikernels that you do actually like regularly regularly run on your machine and like what are they doing and how do they communicate with like the processes on the regular OS? Yeah, so um, because this laptop is running cubes, uh, there's a whole basically like inter VM communication layer um, that uh, there's uh, there's an OCaml library for. So the unikernels, uh, so you can write a unikernel that uses that library to do communication about uh, about various things that are happening in the system, just like uh, just like the Linux VMs that are here have special drivers for doing that particular communication. So for example, um, uh, in Cubes, you have all of, your, uh, all of your VMs that you use for stuff like browsing the internet and like showing slides and stuff, like your ones that you actually interact with yourself. And then there are, there's this concept of a number of like service VMs. So things that are like your access to the network. And then you have um, actually a firewall in between them. So the, uh, the access to the network that your computer has is mitigated, is, uh, sorry, not mitigated, but um, it's sort of gatewayed by this firewall. That firewall is a, is a unikernel on my system. Uh, my blog is also a unikernel. Um, how useful that is is a different question. You used to be able to play a cool game on it, but now you can't, uh, bit rot, sorry. Um, so uh, yeah, we're, there are a lot of people working on these like, really small, specific uh, unikernels specifically for the context of Cubes OS because a lot of users of Cubes OS are as concerned about handling unvalidated input as I think makes sense. 
Um, and if they have some piece of something that they got from just God knows where on the internet, um, really, really, really want that to be segmented down as far as possible. So like if you get an image, they really want the thing that evaluates it and shows it to you to only be able to know how to take an image and draw pixels on the screen. Um, and things like that, I think, are probably in the short term where we're going to see the most development with stuff like Mirage OS. Any last questions? Nope, okay. Big round of applause for Mindy. Um, cool. Thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you again to AppNexus for hosting us here. Um, forever and always, what happened? Uh, I turned off the HDMI. Sorry. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it would be so distracting. <laughs> um, Thanks, AppNexus. <laughs> yes, thank you, AppNexus. Um, our next local host talk will be in mid June ish. We will announce it on our blog and on our website as soon as we can. It will also be held here. It's nice and easy. Um, big round of applause again for Mindy. Um, 